Number 10, The Nuclear Shadows of Hiroshima. With Oppenheimer out in theaters, why not start off this list about the bombing of Hiroshima? For those of you who don't know, on the 6th and 9th of August 1945, the United States detonated two atomic bombs over the Japanese cities of Hiroshima and Nagasaki, respectively. The aerial bombings together killed between 129,000 and 226,000 people, most of whom were civilians and remain the only use of nuclear weapons in an armed conflict. Now, for all the people who lost their lives, only a nuclear shadow remained. When the bomb detonated at 1,900 feet above the city center of Hiroshima, the subsequent explosion caused temperatures of 10,000 degrees Fahrenheit to annihilate nearly everything within 1,600 feet of the bomb's blast zone. Almost anything and anyone within a mile was destroyed. The bomb's light and heat were so extreme that they bleached the city's exposed surfaces, except in places where an unsuspecting person should shielded the building or sidewalk or bridge from the blast with their own body in their final moments alive. It's truly disturbing that people were just enjoying their lives and it was gone in an instant and that you can physically see that with the shadows. Number 9. Radium Girls The Radium Girls were female factory workers who contracted radiation poisoning from painting radium dials, watch dials with hands with self-luminous paint. The incident occurred at three facilities in the United States, one in Orange, New Jersey beginning around 1917 one in Ottawa, Illinois beginning in the early 1920s, and one in Waterbury, Connecticut also in the 1920s. After being told that the paint was harmless, the women in each facility ingested deadly amounts of radium after being instructed to point their brushes on their lips in order to give them a fine tip, and some also painted their fingernails, faces, and teeth with the glowing substance. The prolonged exposure to the radium caused dental pain, loose teeth, lesions, and ulcers, and the failure of tooth extractions to heal were some of these conditions. Many of the women later began to develop amenia, bone fractures, and caused their vertebrae to collapse and their jaws to swell up and fall off. And their lives were slowly ended in agony while battling cancer. The photo here shows one of these victims and it's truly heartbreaking. Number 8. Crime Scene Message Called the lipstick killer, William Herons liked to take the lives of women. On June 5, 1945, Josephine Ross was discovered deceased in her home. She had been pierced repeatedly with a blade and was clutching dark colored hairs in her hands. Nearly a year later, Frances Brown was discovered deceased with a blade lodged in her neck and a bullet wound and what they found at the crime scene was scary. Written in lipstick on the wall, a message said, for heaven's sake catch me before I kill more, I cannot control myself. Now the man responsible, William Herons, was caught soon after the message was discovered and was convicted for ending the lives of several people. At the time of his death, William was reportedly Illinois' longest serving prisoner, having spent 65 years in prison. He spent the later years of his sentence at the Dixon Correctional Center in Dixon, Illinois. Though he remained imprisoned until his death, William had recanted his confession and claimed to be the victim of coercive interrogation and police brutality. So who really knows the truth, but that message is haunting, and I can't even imagine what was going through the heads of the first responders who found it. Number 7. The Exorcism of Annalise Michael Annalise Michael was a German woman who underwent 67 Catholic exorcism rites during the year before her death. When she was younger, she experienced a seizure and was diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with depression and was treated by a psychiatric hospital. By the time she was 20, she'd become intolerant of various religious objects and began to hear voices. After the taking of psychiatric medications for five years failed to improve her symptoms, Annalise and her family became convinced that she was possessed by a demon. As a result, her family appealed to the Catholic Church for an exorcism, and while rejected at first, two priests got permission from the local bishop in 1975. The priests began conducting exorcism sessions, and the parents stopped consulting doctors. A total of 67 exorcism sessions, one or two each week, lasting up to four hours each, were performed over approximately 10 months in 1975 and 1976. None of these worked or improved her condition, and it resulted in her dying of malnutrition at the age of 23 in 1976, weighing just 68 pounds. Now this is a ghastly photo of her when she was possessed, and I can't imagine what that poor girl went through. 
Number 6. The Diet Love Pass Incident The Diet Love Pass Incident was an event in which 9 Soviet hikers died in the northern Ural Mountains between February 1st and 2nd, 1959, under uncertain circumstances. This creepy photo shows the determined group traversing in the harsh terrain just before they met their fate on the night of February 1st. Now, what happened? The experienced trekking group from the Ural Polytechnical Institute, led by Igor Dyatlov, had established a camp in the Russian SFSR of the Soviet Union. Now overnight something caused them to cut their way out of their tent and flee the campsite while inadequately dressed for the heavy snowfall and sub-zero temperatures. After the group's bodies were discovered, an investigation by Soviet authorities determined that six of them had died from hypothermia while the other three had died by physical trauma. One victim had major skull damage, two had severe chest trauma, and another had a small crack in his skull. Four of the bodies were found laying in running water in a creek, and three of those four had damaged soft tissue of the head and face, and two of the bodies had missing eyes, one had a missing tongue, and one had missing eyebrows. No one's really too sure what happened to them and why it happened either, but it's just strange. Number 5. Shell Shocked Soldier Before shell shock was called war neurosis or post traumatic stress disorder, and before experts actually began to understand the psychological trauma that the war could cause, veterans of World War I were largely left to fight their own mental health battles. Now, shell shock is a word that originated during World War I to describe the type of post traumatic stress disorder that many soldiers experienced during the war. It is a reaction to the intensity of the bombardment and fighting that produced a helplessness, which could manifest as panic fear, flight, or an inability to reason, sleep, talk, or walk. During the war, the concept of shell shock was poorly defined, and cases of shell shock could be interpreted as either physical or psychological injury. Now, the creepy historical image of the shell shocked soldier seen here starkly highlights the horror of the war and what being stuck in the trenches during the Battle of Fleurs Corset could do to a man. Captured in September 1916, this photo was taken years before World War I even ended. By the time the end came, countless other men would suffer a similar fate. Number 4. The Frozen Man of Mount Everest In May 1996, mountain climber Beck Weathers and his team attempted to complete their ascent of Mount Everest. Although they only had a small stretch to go, Beck came down with a bad case of snow blindness, and after getting stuck in a harrowing blizzard with a wind chill of 100 degrees below zero, he fell into a hypothermic coma. Frostbite set on his nose and hands, both of which were later amputated. Miraculously, he managed to survive, walked back to camp, and was airlifted for treatment. Initially, I thought I was in a dream, Beck later recalled. Then I saw how badly frozen my right hand was, and that helped bring me around to reality. Now, for those of you who don't know, climbing Mount Everest is extremely dangerous, and it's a miracle that he's alive. Number 3. The Human Dolls Anatoly Moskvin is a Russian former journalist, college professor, and self-dubbed necropolyist with expert knowledge of cemeteries. Now, this man was a little strange, as he loved collecting dolls. He had many, and the figure he had resembled antique dolls. They wore fine and varied clothing, some wore knee-high boots, and others had makeup over their faces Anatoly had covered in fabric. He had also hidden their hands in fabric, except these dolls were not dolls, they were mummified corpses of human girls. Yeah, you heard that right. He was obsessed with digging up the dead and making dolls out of their corpses. After making his human dolls, he kept them in his home as his companions and lovers. I kissed her once, then again, then and again, Anatoly wrote about one of his dolls made from the body of a young girl. Police finally caught him in 2011 after years of increasing suspicion at the growing number of discarded graves in his home city. When the police searched his home, they found 26 life side dolls, or rather mummified corpses, scattered throughout. When police moved one of the bodies, it played music as if on cue, as inside the chests of many of the dolls, Anatoly had embedded music boxes. There were also photographs and plaques taken off the gravestones, doll making manuals, and maps of local cemeteries strewn about the apartment. Police even discovered that the clothes worn by the mummified corpses were the clothes in which they were buried. Now this is just overall disturbing, I just can't. <laughs> Number 2. Michael Rockefeller 
Michael Rockefeller, the son of New York governor and soon to be U.S. Vice President Nelson Rockefeller, disappeared somewhere in Papua New Guinea in the early 1960s. Seen here smiling on his first trip there in May 1960, you wouldn't be aware of his fate. In November 1961, he traveled to the jungles of New Guinea to spend time with the native Azmat tribes when he went missing. Despite a two-week search and a witness who supposedly saw him swimming in the ocean, his body was never found. A theory of what happened is that he was eaten by people, as the Azmat tribes were involved in that practice and sometimes ended people's lives as a part of rituals. It's also been said that his boat overturned near the Azmat region of the island. The boy swam to the shore to look for help and that's it. No one ever saw him again. But at least some members of the local tribes have told stories indicating that Michael's life was ended upon reaching the shore and his body was cut up and the parts were handed out as gruesome trophies. Regardless of what happened, it's just a sad situation overall. And coming in at number one is human zoo. You think animal zoos are bad? Just wait until you hear about us humans putting other humans in a zoo. Human zoos were public displays of people, usually in so-called natural or primitive states. They were most prominent during the 19th and 20th centuries. In the 1870s, exhibitions of so-called exotic populations became popular throughout the Western world. Human zoos could be seen in many of Europe's largest cities, such as Paris, Hamburg, London, Milan, as well as American cities such as New York City and Chicago. Now these photos were taken in 1904 where the US government imported 1,300 indigenous Filipinos from different tribes to display at the St. Louis Exposition in 1904. There's also one girl known as the Filipino Zoo Girl and she was displayed at the Coney Island Zoo in 1904. She was a zoo attraction among the monkeys and lizards to show off the new US possessions in the Philippines. She was bound by ropes and visitors threw her peanuts and it was just overall disgusting how they were treated. Coming in at number 10 is North Korea camp. North Korean prison camps are a place of horror. Now this photo was taken at one of their camps called Chongori Camp. The main purpose of Chongori Camp is to punish people for usual crimes or political crimes such as illegal border crossings. Now the prisoners here are also used as slave laborers and as a result they are forced to do hard and dangerous work for 14 hours a day. The prisoners live in crowded, dirty, insect-infested rooms without heating, while there is just one washing room for 1,000 prisoners. Now, because of these bad hygienic conditions, in the summer of 2003, about 190 prisoners died of an infectious disease. Now, 70 prisoners sleep in a room which is only designed to hold 20 people, lying on the floor without pillows or blankets. Not to mention, prisoners only get 140 grams of rice three times a day, while they are being forced to do hard labor, such as logging with iron chains. Now often, prisoners have their lives ended or they are crippled in work accidents. Prisoners are regularly subjected to beatings and inhumane treatment, all of which are administered by the guard's discretion. When a prisoner breaks a rule, he is tormented and confined in a solitary cell so small where he cannot stretch his legs for many days or weeks. Now many people say these camps have human rights violations, and with everything we do know, I can't imagine all the other horrors of the other camps. Number 9. Dorothy Counts Dorothy Counts is an American civil rights pioneer and one of the first black students admitted to the Harry Harding High School. In 1956, 40 black students from North Carolina applied to transfer to a white school after the passing of the Purcell Plan. Dorothy's family applied her and her two brothers to enroll in an all-white school after her father was approached by Kelly Alexander Sr. Now of her family, only Dorothy was accepted and Dorothy was dropped off on her first day of school by her father, along with their family friend, Edward Tompkins. As their car was blocked from going closer to the entrance, Edwin offered to escort Dorothy to the front of the school while her father parked the car. As she got out of the car to head down the hill, her father told her, hold your head high, you are inferior to no one. Now in this photo, you can see her being harassed by her classmates. After just four days of harassment that threatened her safety, her parents withdrew her from the school, but the images of Dorothy being verbally assaulted by her white classmates were seen around the world. Number 8 
first woman in the Boston Marathon. Catherine Switzer was 20 years old when she decided to run the Boston Marathon in 1967. Now, at the time, it was an all male race. Women were not allowed to run, and organizers always ridiculed them. Now, no one believed a woman could run it, so when Catherine signed up, she signed the necessary paperwork with her initials. When the race started, she set off alongside her boyfriend, Tom Miller, and while running, camera crews and photographers from a press bus spotted her and photographed her a lot. Now, as this was happening, an official spotted her running. Jock Semple, the race manager, ran after her in leather shoes and tried to rip off her number. Get the hell out of my race and give me those numbers, he yelled. Now, before he could pull her out of the race, Tom blocked him. The idea of women running in the marathon was highly controversial. Now, Catherine finished the race, knowing it would look like a publicity stunt if she stopped, and thankfully, five years later, women were given the right to run in the marathon. Number seven, last public execution. Eugen Weidman was a German criminal and serial slayer who was executed by a guillotine in France in June 1939, which was the last public execution in France. After a failed first attempt, Eugen and his accomplices managed to successfully kidnap an American woman named Jean de Coven, and Jean was lured to the house the trio rented, and she was strangled to death by Eugen and buried in the backyard. A couple months later, Eugen shot a chauffeur named Joseph Chofi to death and stole his money. Just two days later, Eugen ended the life of a woman named Janine Keller. Janine was also shot and robbed. Three other people had their lives ended by Eugen and his accomplices, all of them being shot to death and then robbed. Eugen's last victim had a business card from Eugen in his house, which resulted in the police tracking down Eugen, since it seemed that he was one of the last people who had seen the victim alive. When confronted, Eugen tried to shoot the two policemen who had come to arrest him. However, Eugen was knocked unconscious with a hammer by one of the policemen and promptly taken into custody. He was found guilty of homicide and was sentenced to death. On June 17, 1939, Eugen was beheaded outside the prison in St. Pierre in Versailles. The historical behavior by spectators was so scandalous that French President Albert Le Brun immediately banned all future public executions. Number 6. Erase Nikolai Yezkov Nikolai Yezkov was a Soviet secret police officer under Joseph Stalin, who was the head of the NKVD from 1936 to 1938 during the height of the Great Purge. He organized mass arrests, torment, and executions, but then he fell from Stalin's good graces. He was arrested and subsequently admitted in a confession to a range of anti-Soviet activity, including unfound arrests during the Purge. He was executed in 1940 along with others who were blamed for the purge, and Nikolai was not only ousted, executed, and disgraced along with his family, he was then methodically erased from photographs where he had previously appeared with his commander. Overnight, Nikolai went from one of the highest officers in a powerful new world order to a shadow in a poorly lit photo and a name no one dared to utter. Now, Nikolai wasn't the only person to receive this Photoshop treatment, as it was common in the communist government to deny failures and make inconvenient truths, even even people disappear. Now, this practice has continued in current communist led governments where rebellious leaders are removed by force and deleted from official documents. Number 5. Criminals in a Box This disturbing photo was taken in July 1913 by French photographer Albert Kahn. He often took trips through exotic countries, and it was during a visit in Mongolia that he happened to stumble upon this woman who had been condemned to a slow and painful starvation. She was boxed up in what would become her tomb and deposited in a remote desert. There were bowls of water on the ground, and the prisoner is allowed to beg passerbys for food, though not much is given. Now, the photographer was forced to leave her there, as it would be against prime directive of anthropologists to intervene in a culture's law or order system. Anthropologists are only able to observe, they cannot push their own beliefs or interfere in any way. Now, it's just incredibly disturbing though, and I can't imagine what was going through Albert's mind when he found her. Number 4. The Exorcism of Annalise Michael Annalise Michael was a German woman who underwent 67 Catholic exorcism rites during the year before her death. When she was younger, she experienced a seizure and was diagnosed with psychosis caused by temporal lobe epilepsy. Shortly thereafter, she was diagnosed with depression and was treated by a psychiatric hospital. By the time she was 20, she had become intolerant of various religious objects and began to hear voices. After the taking of psychiatric medications for over 5 years failed to improve 
prove her symptoms, and Elise and her family became convinced that she was possessed by a demon. As a result, her family appealed to the Catholic Church for an exorcism, and while rejected at first, two priests got permission from the local bishop in 1975. The priests began conducting exorcism sessions, and the parents stopped consulting doctors. She began increasingly speaking about dying to atone of the wayward youth of the day and the apostate priests of the modern church. Now, a total of 67 exorcism sessions, one or two each week, lasting up to hours each, were performed for approximately 10 months in 1975 and 1976. Number three, Radium Girls. The Radium Girls were female factory workers who contracted radiation poisoning from painting radium dials, watch dials, and hands with self-luminous paint. The incidents occurred at three factories in the United States, one in Orange, New Jersey, beginning around 1917, one in Ottawa, Illinois, beginning in the early 1920s, and one in Waterbury, Connecticut, also in the 1920s. Now, after being told that the paint was harmless, the women in each facility ingested deadly amounts of radium after being instructed to point their brushes on their lips in order to give them a fine tip, and some also painted their fingernails, faces, and teeth with the glowing substance. Now, The prolonged exposure to radium caused dental pain, loose teeth, lesions, and ulcers, and the failure of tooth extractions to heal were some of these conditions. Now, Many of the women later began to develop anemia, bone fractures, and caused their vertebrae to collapse, their jaws to swell up and fall off, and their lungs lives to slowly end in agony while battling cancer. Now the photo here shows one of the victims and it's truly heartbreaking. Number 2, Unit 731. Unit 731 was a covert biological and chemical warfare research and development unit of the Imperial Japanese Army that engaged in lethal human experimentation and biological weapons manufacturing during the Second Sino-Japanese War and World War II. Now this photo shows them experimenting on prisoners. It's it's estimated that this place ended the lives of 200,000 to 300,000 people. Unit 731 was responsible for some of the most notorious war crimes committed by the Japanese armed forces. It routinely conducted tests on people who were dehumanized and internally referred to as logs. Experiments included disease injections, controlled dehydration, biological weapons testing, vivisection, organ harvesting, amputation, and standard weapons testing. In other tests, subjects were deprived of food and water to determine the amount of time until death. They were also placed into low pressure chambers until their eyes popped from their sockets, experimented upon to determine the relationship between temperatures, burns, they were hung upside down until death, crushed with heavy objects, electrocuted, dehydrated with hot fans, injected with animal blood, exposed to lethal doses of x-rays, subjected to various chemical weapons inside gas chambers, injected with seawater, and burned or buried alive. Now this place was truly horrific and so many people suffered. And coming at number one is Blanche Monnier. When French authorities received an anonymous tip in 1901 that a woman was being held prisoner at an aristocrat's house in the city of Portiers, they sent out officers to search the home. Behind the locked door of the pitch black attic, they found a skeletal middle aged woman laying on a straw mattress covered with her own excrement while insects and rotting food littered the floor. Now, the room's odor was so disgusting that officers couldn't even continue their investigation, but they were able to learn that the 55 pound woman still clinging to life after 25 years trapped in that same room was named Blanche Monomer and that her captor was her own mother. Now, this photo of her was taken shortly after she was rescued. Starting off this list in our number 10 spot today, we have the Rothschild Surrealist Ball. The Rothschild family is one of the wealthiest and most powerful families there has ever been. In, and you know with money comes power, and because of that, there have for many years been rumors swirling about just how powerful and influential they really are. That is why in 1972 when they threw what was called a surrealist ball, people began to speculate what kind of things may have taken place at this elaborate soiree. These photos could potentially be very innocent, but there's just something about these elaborate masks coupled with the theories about what this family is really up to that just makes it feel very eerie. This party is one of the most legendary there has ever been, and whether or not they really are involved in shady dealings, that is still impressive. It's like the Project X of the rich and fancy. I'll take pools and kegs of beer over this weird mask party any day. Number 9. 
Winona Ryder. Back in December 2001, Winona Ryder was doing a little Christmas shopping at a Beverly Hills Saks Fifth Avenue. Only she wasn't using her Beetlejuice paycheck at the counter, instead she stole thousands of dollars worth of goods. She had accessories, a handbag, clothes, her arms were literally full of good stuff. She was then sent to the slammer for a whole, you know, four hours. Then of course she was released on a $20,000 bail. She was charged with felony grand theft, but she was also charged with possession of pharmaceutical drugs without a prescription. That is a no-no in Beetlejuice land. She had antidepressants on her while she was being arrested. She wasn't intoxicated or anything. She was actually well-mannered. Even Lieutenant Gary Gilman of the Beverly Hills Police Department said she was a, and I quote, true lady. That's how you, that's a true lady. That's what you gotta do. Just steal a bunch of and be in Beetlejuice. Security footage showed the actress cutting tags off in the store, and when she left, she was immediately detained. It's widely known at this point that Winona isn't a horrible person by any means. She was going through stuff at the time, but this photo, no matter the context, it just looks bad. Honestly, I think it's the floppy hat. She just looks like she's doing a diamond heist. I don't know. In our number eight spot today, we have John F. Kennedy. John F. Kennedy is known for a multitude of reasons, but discussions about his health often don't take place. This photo shows just an inch of the struggle Kennedy went through every day as it is said he suffered from some sort of painful intestinal problems. Apparently things were so bad that for a while it was thought his illness might have been terminal. Aside from the intestinal issues, he also suffered from extreme back pain that stemmed from spinal problems he had as a child. Apparently these back problems were so bad that they almost kept him from service in World War II. After his election, although the world saw him as a young, handsome president, he really was struggling with his health behind the scenes and it can definitely be seen in this photo. However, it is said that whenever anyone when asked him how he was feeling, his only response was that he was in, quote, excellent shape. Number seven, Stalin Photoshop. Deep fakes are getting out of control. Modern technology is really making it hard to tell what's real and what's not. I thought I knew what was up. Apparently my eyes fool me more often than not. Photoshop is also an essential now for pretty much any project, including your selfie. You gotta touch it up a little bit, get rid of those blemishes. Well, back in 1939, a photo of Stalin was published and he looks great. Some would say too good. Well, he retouched a 1924 photo and then used that as his headshot when he became a leader later on. Even if you get a photo with Stalin, you might not be there in the future. Yeah, there's a chance you would be digitally removed even back in the day. Like Nikolai Yetov, for example. The leader of the NKVD was in a photo with Stalin, he was, but around 1937, Nikolai was responsible for orders that had over 1 million people arrested. And to make matters worse, half of them were executed for crimes against the state. So it wasn't ideal to be in a photo with Nikolai. He was denounced, imprisoned, and he died later on in 1940, so Stalin had him erased and replaced digitally. Look at that. If you look close, you can actually see Lizard getting punched by an invisible Spider-Man in the background. Yeah, we caught it. The man was ahead of his time. Even today, we're replacing actors in movies with different actors, and you wouldn't even know. In our number six spot today, we have The Secret Pacific Ocean Air Base. Also known as the Johnson Atoll, this secret air base is located right smack dab in the center of the Pacific Ocean. Said to be the location of numerous nuclear tests, the United States government was sure to release little to no details surrounding this location or what exactly goes on there. How comforting. Something about nuclear and secret seems ominous. Aside from being a little secret base, this place is also the home to a thriving community of nesting seabirds, and since it's literally in the middle of the ocean, the marine life surrounding it is significantly diverse. This has all led to there being teams that do environmental monitoring and maintenance to protect the wildlife. Like how weird is it that this is the place they use to store and dispose of Agent Orange, but they're also like, we gotta protect the birds. I mean, I'm glad they're protecting the birds, I just think it's ironic. To get into this place, you either need to be a part of the United States Air Force or have a special use permit from the US Fish and Wildlife Service. So random. Number five, a bunny's tail. Back in 1960, the Playboy Club in New York was one of Hugh Hefner's greatest accomplishments at the time. The club was, of course, the talk of the town until Gloria Steinem came in. Gloria was a feminist writer. She created Miss Magazine back in 1972. She's a very big lady. I don't know what I was about to say. She's a big deal, but her career began much earlier around the 60s. See, she got a job as one of these Playboy bunnies and worked at the club undercover. How badass is that? She was secretly taking note of how this key holders only establishment was operating. And it was pretty sketchy. I mean, use your imagination. It was horrible towards women. They're wearing high heels while running drinks. The staff were these young, young women, the bunnies, they had to wear these black bodysuits, the puffy white tails, the whole getup. And at age 28, Gloria worked undercover there for three weeks. The piece she released after, appropriately titled A Bunny's Tail, got so much attention.
attention that it kickstarted her freelance career and made her a feminist icon. This photo of Gloria undercover shows you the comfortable work outfits she had to wear. I sure hope she had her non-slips on. It's a really dark establishment too. Say corner a lot. In a collection of her writings, Gloria reflects on the undercover piece, saying my expose of working in a Playboy club has outlived all the Playboy clubs, both here and abroad. That was before Hefner passed away in 2017. She didn't mean to, you know, take a jab at him, but she also did outlive Hugh Hefner. I'll say it. She doesn't have to take the smoke on this style. I connected the dots for you. In our number four spot today, we have Cher. Cher is often referred to as the goddess of pop, and for good reason. She is an absolute legend and an icon. She has never been afraid to push the limits or go outside of the box, so when we came across this photo, we were both surprised and not so surprised at the same time. This little photo comes to us from 1959 when Cher was just 13 years old. As it turns out, Cher was driving when she wasn't supposed to. In a 2013 appearance on The Tonight Show, she explained that a friend of hers had asked her to watch his car while he ran inside to do something. Cher moved the car a couple of times to get out of the way of other people, but then decided that he was simply just taking too long and decided to drive herself over to the drive-in theater. Luckily, everyone was okay, and once the police brought her to the station, they simply just called her mom to come and pick her up. Apparently, she didn't even know she was being arrested at the time, which I totally think you can tell by her expression in the mugshot. Number three, Bill Clinton and Monica Lewinsky. Of course, we all remember this one. At one point, we heard about it, be it on LimeWire in the middle of your song, this would randomly play. Bill Clinton talking about not having sexual relations with that woman. Back when we had to download music, that was a classic. So loud, so out of nowhere and so loud. But this was a huge presidential scandal, you know, back when they weren't every other week. It was 1998, Clinton White House intern Monica Lewinsky was 22 years old and they had a sexual relationship from 1995 to 1997. They definitely did. But Lewinsky said she hooked up with Bill nine different times at the White House. Apparently, according to your schedule, Hillary Clinton was at the White House for at least seven of those visits. Whenever I see this photo, I wish I was alive to see this unfold in real time. I mean, I was alive, but I was three. You know what I mean? I wasn't like, Damn, that's crazy. In our number two spot today, we have an A-12 spy plane. This photo is one that shows the remnants of a crashed A-12 spy plane from 1963, as well as the subsequent cleanup and rescue mission. This crash happened during a test flight when pilot Ken Collins was testing the plane's subsonic engines at a low altitude. Ken was then flying under his Area 51 code name, which was Ken Colmar, which is just the coolest thing. I really want a secret agent code name. Anyway, at 25,000 feet, the plane basically inverted and somehow landed itself upside down. So now Ken is flying upside down and he knew he wasn't going to be able to recover so he ejected himself. In the end Ken was okay but the same obviously couldn't be said for the plane. To make this cool story even cooler apparently US officials later made Ken undergo hypnosis and treatments of sodium pentothal which is thought to be like a truth serum in order to be sure he relayed the details of the incident as fully and as truthfully as possible. That's serious business. Usually I just ask someone a couple times and then go with whatever they tell me. And finally, number one, Charlie Chaplin and co. I'm wearing a hat now and a sweater. I'll never tell you why. When we think of Chaplin, we often think of the mustache, the physical comedy, the hat, the fact that he lost a Charlie Chaplin lookalike contest, yada, 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 we know the rest. We remember the performances that he would give us for the most part. It's how you want to be remembered as an artist, ideally. Now, when it comes to Chaplin, though, those old-timey photos of the comedic genius also include his number of different wives, a lot of them being much, much younger. The first two being years old when they were married, right? His first marriage was with Mildred Harris in 1918. He was 29, she was 15. Odd, that marriage only lasted two years, and then he married Lita Gray in 1924. She was also 16. Odd again, that marriage ended with a messy 50-page divorce where it was revealed Chaplin was pretty in all of his manners as a husband. Still the biggest film star, regardless of how he treated co-stars and also ex-wives, he went on to marry Paulette Goddard nine years later, who was 22. A bit better, but here's the crappy part. She said she was 16 when they met, so a year older than his ex-wives. And he was still pursuing her after she said that, so... Odd again. He moved into her mansion shortly after they began talking. Seven years later, that relationship ended too, and thus began his new relationship with Una O'Neill. Chaplin in his 50s, and Una at age... 18. He was the same age as her father. Makes the mustache a little less fun now, doesn't it? They both remained together until Chaplin's passing in 1977. We're talking about Pete Davidson when really we should be talking about Charlie Chaplin still. Starting off at 
number 10, vampire killings. So starting us off, we have the supposed vampire killings from the 1800s. Now, spoiler alert here, they weren't actually vampires. Well, I guess I don't know that for sure, but I'm gonna go out on a limb and say they weren't. Anyways, back in the 1800s, people in New England believed that cadavers were rising from their graves at night and preying on the living. So to solve this problem, they began exhuming the cadavers. Now, some kept it simple and just turned the cadaver face down, but others jumped to more extreme methods like ripping the bones apart and rearranging them, or burning the deceased person's heart and inhaling the smoke. Apparently at the time, it was believed inhaling the smoke cured tuberculosis, though I can only imagine it made matters much worse for them. Some towns were so into the ritual that they would even hold festivals during the process and celebrate the exhumation and subsequent destruction of the corpses all together. So while it was incredibly unsettling, they did truly believe they were vampires haunting them in the night, so I guess it gave them some peace of mind. Next up at number 9, dentures. While today dentures are made from composite resin or sometimes porcelain, during the 18th and 19th centuries, of course, those materials weren't available. But as you can imagine, people were still losing teeth at an even higher rate due to the high sugar diet, attempted teeth whitening, which was really just wearing away their enamel instead of brightening it, and the overall lack of knowledge around hygiene. So dentures were still needed and wanted by many. So what was their material of choice? Well, for the easiest and most profitable route, many would acquire the teeth from dead bodies. Although if you had some money, you might be able to afford dentures made from ivory. Other materials were sometimes the teeth of animals or wood, but honestly, I think we can all agree that none of those sound like terribly sanitary options, considering professional physicians at the time weren't sterilizing instruments and some didn't even believe in disinfecting prior to surgery. Next up at number 8, stained glass. If you walk into just about any old church, you'll notice the walls are decorated with beautiful stained glass. But what might surprise you is that in some of the particularly older pieces, there is a strange ingredient that helps it all come together. In 1112, a German monk wrote about the process of creating the beautifully colored glass, and as he detailed, it starts off innocently enough, adding sand and potash at a high temp until it becomes molten. From there, they'd add a stabilizer before coloring the glass with different metallic oxides like copper, cobalt, and gold. But once the glass was cooled and shaped, the small details were added by paint. They made the paint usually from lead or copper and would then suspend it in urine. So quite literally, some of those old stained glass windows were painted with pea paint, which I mean kind of just makes me giggle if I'm honest, but it is definitely a weird ingredient to think about being in paint. Coming in at number 7, leather bound books. Nowadays it's unusual to even find real leather on anything, but once upon a time the leather on books wasn't even from cows, it was from people. Called anthropodermic bibliopegy, the books were made in a similar way as they would now, but obviously with one huge difference. They used human skin instead of an animal. While there are actually only 18 confirmed books of its kind that still exist, we have no idea just how many there could have been all those years ago. Allegedly the books were usually made from executed convicts, and during the French Revolution there were rumors that a tannery for human human skin was established outside of Paris. I mean, it kind of gives me the willies to think about it, and I'm just glad we've moved on to a different material to bind our books today. Next up at number 6, Minnie Dean. Wilhelmina Dean, or Minnie as she was often referred to, was a nanny in New Zealand during 1880 and was a well-known caretaker in her town. But something was off with the woman, and soon she began having quite the dark spot on her name and career. In 1889, one of the young people under her care suddenly died, as if out of nowhere, and initially it was viewed as a freak accident, but two years later the same thing happened again. Now with two minors perished under her care, police decided to investigate further into the matter. After a bit of sleuthing, it was concluded that under Minnie's care, the two minors were 
as she was attempting to take out life insurance on them. Police immediately took the remaining young boy in her care, finding it in dirty clothes and drinking curdled milk. By 1895, the investigation into her crimes continued and she was spotted trying to flee on a train with another victim in her arms. And when police searched her house, they found three more covered up victims. Eventually found guilty for all her crimes, she was the first and only woman ever hanged in New Zealand. Next up at number 5, Radiation Test Subject. In 1999, a man named Hisachi Uchi was a power plant technician and he became known for being exposed to the highest amount of radiation of any human in history. While working at the Tokamura nuclear power plant, after a lack of safety protocols, improper training, and just an overall pressure to meet deadlines, Uchi and his co-workers made a terrible error. They mistakenly mixed an incorrect measurement of radioactive materials into the wrong tank. And as you've probably figured out, it caused a near fatal burst of gamma rays. Hisashi, who happened to be the closest to the incident, was brutally injured and sent to the hospital. Once he was there, it was discovered he had no more white blood cells, so essentially meaning that he had no remaining immune system. And despite being in intense pain with a rapidly deteriorating condition, doctors kept him alive under the family's request. So for 83 days, Uchi remained alive, being used as a test subject for experimental radiation treatment by the doctors, which, I mean, in their defense was the request of the family, but still, he endured several cardiac arrests, lost all of his skin, and suffered brain damage as well as organ failure. One of the last things Uchi ever said was, quote, I can't take it anymore, I'm not a guinea pig. And then finally, one more cardiac arrest released him from his torture. Coming in at number 4, Mamiya. Most widely practiced between the 12th to the 17th century, although there were a few cases in the 18th century that pop up, Mamiya was widely used as a means of medicine in many European countries. Now if you can't tell by the name, Mamiya is creepily just as it sounds, the use of human remains to fix a living person's ailments. It was believed by many of the top physicians at the time that ingesting certain remains prompted the medicinal power of the mummy and could cure things like coagulated blood, pain, coughs, inflammation, cramps, and even heal open wounds. Now, they didn't just sit around eating the carcass directly, instead they would either grind the bones into a powder and drink it from there, or drink an extracted liquid from the embalmed individual. In fact, it was so popular at one point that it's believed the reason there are so few mummies these days is because of the high demand of flesh at the time. Coming in at number 3, James Jameson. One of the heirs to the Jameson whiskey family fortune, Jameson considered himself to be an adventurer of sorts and often traveled to far off lands detailing the trips in his diary. In 1888, Jameson decided to head out to explore the Congo, and while there he wrote about and demanded some gruesome things from the locals. So before beginning this expedition, Jameson discovered that the area he was visiting was known to have a population that participated in the eating of other humans. Apparently Jameson set out to witness it firsthand, which I mean, why was that his dream? A little suspicious if you ask me, but I digress. <laughs> According to Asad Faran, who was his translator for the trip, Jameson bought a girl from a trader of slaves for a few handkerchiefs and gave her over to the tribe to be Allegedly, he didn't pay the tribe directly, but in a roundabout way, he did sort of pay to have this girl killed. What's even more gross is that he proceeded to draw and paint watercolors of the gruesome event while it happened, which again, just wrong on so many levels. Coming in at number 2, Cambodian Barbies. You may have been taught about the Khmer Rouge in history class, but if they don't ring a bell, essentially they were an extreme communist regime in Cambodia that held government between 1975 to 1979. They were known for being extremely cruel and committed some of the most horrifying acts of genocide in history, with nearly 2 million perishing under their ruling. Now, during their radical rule, the entire country was isolated from all 
foreign influences. This included closing schools, hospitals, factories, banks, foreign agriculture. They believed this would stimulate the rebirth of the country, but of course, all it did was send it into desolate famine and poverty. Led by a man named Pol Pot, the people of the country could not forage for food, despite the fact that everyone was starving, and anyone who disobeyed the orders was killed. Apparently, as the people became more and more desperate, they began to turn to folk magic, turning Barbie dolls into smoking talismans for luck. Thankfully, since its dissolution in 1999, all the leaders have been jailed for their atrocities, and the people are freed from the genocidal regime. And last up in our number one spot, the rabbit woman. Her name was Mary Toft, and in 1726, she became known throughout Surrey, England, as having been the woman who gave birth to rabbits. Now, I know what you're thinking, that isn't possible. And you would be right. But still, the story of how she convinced people it was real was crazy. Apparently, Toft was actually pregnant at one point, but miscarried, and it could have been this that sent her into her madness. Toft began declaring that she was giving birth to various animal parts, and so her local doctor became involved in the case. At first, everyone actually believed her, as in fact, a rabbit did, well, come out of her. And with a doctor backing up her claims, the king and his royal surgeon got involved. Unlike her local doctor, the king surgeon was skeptical, and after discovering corn inside the stomach of one of the rabbits and hay in their droppings, it proved the animal hadn't developed inside Mary. Eventually, Mary Toft admitted to the hoax and explained that she had manually inserted the animals inside her to make the delivery as realistic as possible. She was immediately imprisoned for fraud, and the medical community was ridiculed for having been fooled. Starting off this countdown, we have experimental electrical stimulation. Taken in 1856, this photo shows a man undergoing an experiment with electrical stimulation. And by the looks of it, it was quite painful. So back then they would use the stimulation for a number of reasons. One, to manipulate and experiment on one's nervous system, and two, to treat certain diseases and disorders. Nowadays, this treatment is much safer. They use it to help with injured muscles or manipulate nerves to reduce pain. But back then, they were still trying to get it right. So it makes you wonder how many people underwent these painful experiments, and how many people were accidentally killed before they found the correct voltage to use. In our ninth spot today, we have the lipstick killer. And if you're liking this video so far, then Smash that like button because it really helps us out. William George Herons was an American criminal and potential serial killer that confessed to be the lipstick killer. The lipstick killer was someone who took the lives of a number of women and would often leave a creepy message at the scene of the crime in lipstick. That's how he got the name, Lipstick Killer. The photo I'm about to share with you was a creepy message that he left at the scene of one of his crimes in 1945. He wrote, For heaven's sake, catch me before I kill more. I cannot control myself. Now, this message is creepy for a number of reasons. First, First, you got a man on the loose who can't control his impulses and he just admitted it. And second, look how creepy it just looks with the lipstick smeared everywhere and such. It took the police six more months from the time this message was written to finally catch William. This photo is just a scary and dark reminder of the horrors this man committed. Moving on to number eight, we have the poverty. This photo from 1948 shows just how bad poverty was in the 1940s to 50s in America. This is when the poverty rate was at its highest. In this photo, Mr. and Miss Ray Shalifo were facing eviction from their Chicago apartment. They were so desperate for money that they had to sell their kids. Now, this photo was a staged photo, but it still shows a heartbroken mother not knowing what else to do. Within two years, all four kids were sold into different homes. It also sheds the light on how different laws were back then. Nowadays, that is very much illegal to do. Anyways, this is a very heartbreaking photo. Like, I can't imagine what that family went through. Moving on to number seven, we have the nuclear shadow. On August 6, 1945, the United States dropped an atomic bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb was so powerful that people up to a mile of it were vaporized. All that was left of them was their shadows burnt into stone. This is a creepy image that shows one of the bomb's victims. It's a silhouette of an elderly man or woman with a cane. So the bomb's light and heat were so powerful that it bleached any exposed surfaces. In this case, the person's body shielded that part on the sidewalk, and that's why an imprint was left there. All around Hiroshima, there were multiple of these body outlines. It's very disturbing and sad. It just shows their final moments alive. In our sixth spot today, we have the Stanford Prison Experiment. The Stanford Prison Experiment set out to explore the psychological effects of imprisonment. It started on August 14, 1971. A university psychology professor
professor gathered a bunch of student volunteers and divided them into groups. 11 were assigned the role of guards and 10 were assigned the role of prisoners. It's going to be a two week experiment where the volunteers would play their part in a make believe prison. But the experiment had to be ended after only six days. The volunteers got way into character. Some guards turned sadistic. They really exercised their power over the prisoners. Whereas many prisoners became depressed and showed signs of extreme stress. The study and this creepy photo provide a chilling look at what humans are capable of. We are now at our fifth and halfway mark with the wild man suit. Not only is this a dark photo from history, but it's also a very mysterious one. This suit that you're seeing is what historians named the wild man suit. It consists of a double layered set of armor covered in one inch long iron nails. What was it used for you may ask? Well, no one knows for sure. One popular theory is that it was used during bear hunting in the 1800s. Or it was used in bear baiting. Don't know if that's true, but it looks very uncomfortable to wear. Maybe it was a twisted torture device. The executioner would wear it and then give the prisoner a nice big and tight hug. I don't know, I'm just guessing, but either way it's messed up. In our fourth spot today we have the ruins of Hiroshima. Here is another very scary and sad photo taken after America dropped a bomb on Hiroshima. The bomb had an explosive yield equal to 15,000 tons of TNT. In fact, it destroyed 5 square miles of the city. This photo shows the ruins of the once beautiful city. Buildings and wildlife were completely destroyed by this bomb. In fact, the US remains to be the only country to ever use an atomic bomb in war. It had a huge lasting impact on the city that we should never forget about. In our third spot today we have the Titanic. On April 15, 1912, the infamous ship the Titanic began to sink. 1,500 passengers sank with the ship after a hit an iceberg during its maiden voyage. The few that did manage to survive fled on lifeboats. This is a picture of the last lifeboat approaching the rescue ship. You can see it was crammed with passengers as all the lifeboats were. This photo serves as a reminder of this great tragedy in history and all the innocent individuals that were impacted by this disaster. In our second spot today we have the San Francisco earthquake of 1906. In 1906 San Francisco was hit with a massive 7.9 magnitude earthquake. It has since garnered the title of the most powerful earthquake in Northern Californian history. This earthquake not only caused homes to come crumbling down, but it also started a number of fires throughout the city. Hundreds of fires started as a result of the broken gas lines. These fires went on for three days, engulfing 500 city blocks. More than 3,000 people passed away from the earthquake and fires. 20,000 buildings were destroyed and 200,000 citizens were left homeless. It was very sad and tragic. This is a photo from this devastating time. This was after all the damage was done. People lined the streets and just stared at the destruction that the earthquake caused. And in our number one spot today we have the American Buffalo. Now this photo is absolutely heartbreaking. This was taken in 1892 Michigan and that is an actual mountain made up of buffalo skulls. That means thousands of buffaloes were slaughtered. No wonder why the buffalo population is considered near threatened and are at risk for extinction. So these skulls were then ground down to be used in making bone china or refining sugar and producing fertilizer. It's said that around the end of the 18th century there were between 30 to 60 million buffaloes on the continent. When this photo was taken the population was at only 456. They literally slaughtered millions of buffalo. What makes it worse is that some of the buffalo were killed purposely just so that the indigenous individuals were deprived of them. And we're starting off with this image here. This photo was taken during a ceremony of of uh, Order of the Solar Temple. This is a very secretive group who would never want their practices being made known to outsiders. It's actually kind of surprising there are actual photos of them in their secret meetings, uh, to be honest. So this group is pretty bizarre, very disturbing. Yes, they are still around today. Luckily, there hasn't been any real drama in uh, recent years, though. This is a doomsday cult. At least it was in the 80s and uh, early 90s. It mixed Knights Templar stuff with space. Love a good mixed genre kind of cult. Sci-fi and Knights. I'm sold. Oh wait, you mean I, I gotta shed my physical body and reach a higher plane of existence on a distant planet and the only way to do that is to take my own life? I'm out. I'm out. On October 4th of 1994, 53 members of the cult in Canada and Switzerland either took their own lives or violently took the lives of others, and then the homes where they died were set on fire. Two similar events would take place in the months 
that followed. There is something so unsettling about the photos of them during their ceremonies. Obviously, this group was involved in these horrific incidents, but even setting aside the context, if I had no idea what these pictures were, I'd still find them a bit creepy. The robes, the Templar-style iconography, the old graininess of the images, it all just makes me feel uneasy. Staying with the order of the solar temple for number nine here, this is another unsettling image for you. This is a coffin being carried out on a stretcher from a house in Quebec, Canada. You can clearly see that there had been a fire in the house. This incident took place in 1997, a few years after the initial mass on alivings took place in Switzerland. Five members took their own life inside the house before it was set on fire with an automatic ignition system. Next, we have the Superior Universal Alignment. This photo here is of the cult's leader, Valentina de Andrade, when she was being arrested, a moment she would probably rather forget. Superior Universal Alignment was a cult in Brazil that blended dark, satanic elements with UFOs. The media focused more on the satanic element, as this was the late 80s and early 90s, and the whole satanic panic thing was, was still somewhat of a thing. But also, some believe uh, this group was involved in organ trafficking. So what happened is that between 1989 and 1993 in Altamira, Brazil, a number of young men either went missing or were found dead under very violent circumstances. Authorities had a hard time identifying the culprit until two of their prime suspects mentioned they were in a group called the Superior Universal Alignment. This group was again led by Valentina de Andrade. She had this very odd belief that males born after 1981 were essentially evil because she'd been contacted by extraterrestrial beings who, uh, who told her so. Anyway, she was investigated, but there wasn't enough evidence for her involvement in the crimes to land her in jail. Luckily, four other members were convicted, but Valentina ended up fleeing to Argentina, where she disturbingly still preaches her insane beliefs today. Number seven, Maxim. This is a photo taken of several members of the group, many whose faces have been obscured, uh, with a few prominent members like Alison Mack and leader Keith Raniere, clearly visible. Nexium was a self-help group turned cult that got into hot water. The leader, Keith Ranieri, was accused of running a secret society within Nexium where people, mostly women, go figure, were manipulated into having intimate relationships with him. Uh, these members were also branded and they were blackmailed in order to keep quiet about everything. Some high-profile folks like Smallville actress Alison Mack got caught up as well. The whole thing was a complete mess, but luckily in the end, the creep Ranieri got convicted on various charges. Mac and others also faced legal consequences. But Ranieri is still involved in the cult from behind bars, with several members branching off still being active today. At number six, we have Love Has Won. This is the last photo of Amy Carlson, leader of a cult called Love Has Won. You probably see something immediately off about her complexion. It has a gray, bluish tint to it. That's because she was ingesting high amounts of silver. Carlson claimed to be the embodiment of a spiritual figure, often referring to herself as the divine or Mother God. Love has one attracted followers who believed in Carlson's divine status and followed her spiritual teachings. Carlson claimed to have been reincarnated like hundreds of times, having been uh, some pretty big names in her former lives. Joan of Arc, Marilyn Monroe, Cleopatra, and of course, Jesus. I, I had no idea that all those people were the same person. Pretty incredible. She also claimed to have talked to Robin Williams after he died, of course. Donald Trump was also her father in a past life. I mean, what a, what a legacy. She also preached that lizard people were part of a cabal that was forcing the planet to be in a low vibration state. Now, this is all pretty goofy, but nothing evil, right? Well, several former members came out talking about all the manipulation. Yeah, uh, manipulation. Really, there's manipulation going on here? I can't. I can't didn't realize. And uh, also mistreatment. And this all went on at the hands of Amy and other higher-ups in the group. There was also apparently a lot of racist and anti-Semitic rhetoric going on, which really doesn't surprise me when you read the long, long list 
insane stuff this lady was talking about. Oh, hippies, you truly are the worst. In 2021, news broke that Amy Carlson had passed away. Her body was discovered in a residence in Colorado where the group was based. She was basically mummified with her eyes almost having rotted away completely. Looks like love lost. Loser. Next on the list, we have the Branch Davidians. This photo here was taken during the famous 51 day siege of former leader David Koresh's compound in Waco, Texas in 1993. So without any context, it looks just like any other fire, but looking at these images, knowing what was going on, that so many people were dying, it's just very dark. In the early 90s, the Branch Davidians were a doomsday cult being led by David Koresh, who managed to convince everyone he was the final prophet. He and several other members were living in a compound near Waco, Texas. The authorities got involved due to suspicions about illegal weapons in the compound, which there very much were. In 1993, the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, and Firearms attempted to raid the compound, and it went south pretty fast. A shootout ensued, leaving several dead on both sides. The situation just continued to escalate, and the FBI ended up taking over. They surrounded the compound for a lengthy siege. Eventually, the FBI launched a final assault using tear gas. A few hours later, a fire erupted within the compound. It's still unclear how it actually started. Some believe the FBI caused it, but there's other that's, that, that uh, blame the Davidians themselves. In any case though, the compound burned down and Koresh died inside along with many of his followers. Number four, the Children of God. This is a photo of members of the Children of God in prayer. You wouldn't know it based on this image alone, but there were some very dark things going on behind closed doors, and it just adds a very dark layer to images like this one. The cult is still active today, but now they really want to distance themselves from former leader David Berg and the horrific things that went on in the 70s and 80s, now calling themselves the Family International. The group was founded by David Berg, aka Satan Personified, in the late 1960s. They started out as a hippie-like group with unconventional beliefs. They believed in a combination of Christianity and free love, often engaging in communal living, and you could probably guess what that entailed based on the whole free love thing. As the group evolved, allegations of exploitation and mistreatment began to come to light, and members were reportedly encouraged to use physical intimacy as a means of recruiting new followers, a practice known as flirty fishing. Ugh. Uh, several members started seeing the dark side of the group though, and I can't really go into details here, uh, but suffice to say, this was not a group you would ever want to raise a family in. Former members have uh, come out since, accusing the cult of using mind control techniques, and subjecting followers to psychological manipulation, and much, much worse. Next on the list, we have Om Shinrikyo. This photo here is of the military cleaning a subway car after the Tokyo subway sarin attack of 1995. Am Shinrikyo was a Japanese cult founded by Shoko Asahara in 1987. The group became infamous after the deadly Tokyo subway sarin gas attack in 1995, which took the lives of 13 people and injured over a thousand. Asahara proclaimed himself to be Christ and the only one who could save followers from the coming apocalypse. The cult kind of blended elements of several religions and spiritual traditions with its leader's doomsday prophecies. The group had a very large following, including some highly educated members. The cult was involved in a number of violent attacks, but the Tokyo subway attack was the worst of the worst, and following this incident, authorities finally cracked down on the cult, leading to the arrest of Asahara and other key members. Asahara uh, was finally sentenced to death uh, for his role in the crimes, but surprisingly, the cult is still active to this day. Number two, the New Russian Orthodox Church. This is a photograph of part of the Doomsday Cult's cave hideout. I think I'd rather just die in the apocalypse than live in that dump, especially because the leader of this cult didn't even let his followers watch TV. What are you gonna do down there? Pyotr Kuznetsov led a Russian Doomsday Cult that gained international attention when in 2007, several members of the cult, known as the True Russian Orthodox Church, barricaded themselves in a remote cave in the Panza region. Kuznetsov wasn't with them 
as he was in police custody. He claimed to be a prophet, and his teachings combined elements of Christianity with apocalyptic visions. The cult believed that the world would soon come to an end, and isolating themselves in the cave, they hoped to be saved from the impending apocalypse. Authorities were alerted to the location of the cave, but members inside were threatening to take their own lives if police tried to intervene. As the situation continued to escalate, authorities became more and more concerned about the well-being of the cult members, especially given reports of starvation and just the harsh conditions inside the cave. After several months, Russian security forces intervened to finally remove the followers from the cave. Two members had died over the winter, and they'd created these toxic fumes within the cave. Kuznetsov attempted to take his own life after he'd realized his doomsday prediction was wrong. His whereabouts are not currently known to the public, but it's believed that he is still alive. And finally, we have Adolfo Constanzo. This photo here kind of looks like a witch's cauldron, and that's pretty much exactly what it is. The cauldron belonged to Adolfo de Jesus Constanzo, the leader of a drug smuggling cult that also performed ritualistic human sacrifices. The group mainly operated in Mexico. Constanzo practiced his own kind of twisted version of Palo Mayambe, a form of African Caribbean religion. The cult engaged in drug trafficking, human sacrifice, and ritualistic practices. Constanzo believed that these rituals granted him these supernatural powers and, and protection that would aid in the group's criminal activities. In 1989, a series of events unfolded which led to the downfall of the cult. A kidnapped victim managed to escape, and he informed authorities about the cult's activities. And then in a subsequent raid on the cult's compound, Constanzo and several other followers died in a shootout with police. Mm -hmm.